Did you ever wonder why so many flowers look a little something like this? Can you believe that something as small as a hummingbird has the power to change the world? We're on an amazing journey to uncover the secret lives of these birds and to try to understand just how powerful they've been in shaping the world around us. That's a little difficult though because you see, these birds move so fast that our human eyes can barely comprehend what goes on in their world. We need special equipment to do that. Join me on today's expedition as we take a unique look at these tiny little birds that seem to live their lives in Fast Forward. What amazing little biological machines these hummingbirds are. It's one of the reasons I'm drawn to them. They're just so cool. They're the quintessential backyard bird. They're not hard to attract to your home. They don't mind people. Matter of fact, we may be having a huge positive impact on the populations of species like the ruby-throated hummingbird just through the activities of the way that we manage our yards to attract hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are active all day. They're not like that migrant warbler that you're trying to get right after the crack of dawn in the early spring or the early fall. They're easy to see. And that is the reason why so many people get sucked in to loving hummingbirds. And in the process, I think, really start to develop a greater appreciation for the interconnectedness of animals, plants, and the world, and the choices that people make. One of the reasons people love hummingbirds are the incredible, dazzling colors that these birds have. Most animals, when you think of the colors that they display, those colors are produced by pigments. But that's not the case with most of the colors that we see in hummingbirds. You see, hummingbirds have really specially adapted feathers. The feathers are formed so that they can refract light when held at certain angles. So what you're seeing is really a bird that isn't that colorful, that's made colorful by the angle of the light bouncing off the specially formed feathers that these birds have. It's, it's refraction. And that's how a hummingbird that otherwise looks dull at certain angles all of a sudden will become completely resplendent and brilliant when the light hits it in just the right way. Whether it be the green or the bright red, the ruby, for instance, in the ruby-throated hummingbird. Another one of the things that I really think attracts people to hummingbirds is their size. I mean, they're tiny, they're really cute. Their size ranges from between two to 20 grams. I mean, the smallest of these is barely larger than a bumblebee. All hummingbirds are found in the New World, and they're all found in one bird family, the Trochilidae, which translates to small bird. So everything about these birds is on a small scale, and that's good because they have a super fast metabolism. You see, if they were large, they'd never be able to accomplish what they're able to do in that small frame. We call them hummingbirds because they hum when they fly. That humming sound is made by the wing beats. And in a general, just regular flight, when they may be traveling 25 or 30 miles an hour, they're beating their wings about 80 times a second. An incredible speed, and that produces that humming sound. Now, their wing beats can go upwards of 200 beats a second on a really fast flight, and they can fly, at least during a dive, at speeds of up to 60 miles an hour. But just because these birds are really tiny and really cute, doesn't mean that they're really peaceful. Matter of fact, you don't have to watch a feeder for very long to realize just how aggressive hummingbirds really are. Hummingbirds are incredibly territorial. A feeder is a great, highly concentrated food supply, and everyone seems to want to sip. Over and over again, one is driven off by another, and a steady wave of birds seem to jockey for their slot at the nectar. But to truly understand what's happening, we have to slow things down to a speed that we can comprehend. We can't do this with standard equipment. We need a really fast camera. Only with an extensive setup like this can we magically slow down their world to expose their secrets to flight. We're filming at 6,200 frames per second. And at this speed, what happens in a tenth of a second reveals intense drama that our human eyes simply can't catch.
These interactions truly show us the incredible maneuvers these birds are capable of. They can fly in all directions. In fact, these are the only birds that can fly upside down and backwards. They do this because they have mastered the art of hovering. The mechanics behind hovering have to do with the way they beat their wings. In super slow motion, we can see clearly the simple but typical figure eight fashion of their wing movements. This allows them to generate lift on both the upstroke and the downstroke. Super efficient flight. An incredible 30% of their weight is flight muscle. Hovering is an art that is translated into the form of the plants that they feed on. These plants don't have landing platforms, so the birds have to hover to reach the nectar. Well, it's not mere coincidence that a hummingbird would be drawn to this flowering plant, coral bean. Out of all the flowers that are blooming here at the South Carolina Botanical Garden right now, this one drew it in like a moth to a flame. And the reason is because it fits the syndrome of hummingbird pollinated plants. This flower is red, and tubular and produces lots of nectar. It's adapted along with the hummingbird to produce this type of flower. Hummingbirds, like all birds, can see color and they're drawn specifically to the color red. Hummingbirds can even see in the ultraviolet spectra so they can zero in on flowers that are producing nectar that are really co-adapted to attract that specific pollinator. We call the condition a pollination syndrome. When you think about a hummingbird plant, you should automatically think about a red flower. And another one that's blooming right now and attracting lots of hummingbirds is this one. This is cardinal flower, and that is the species of lobelia. Most of the species of lobelia produce blue flowers, like a very close relative here, the lobelia syphilitica, which is the great blue lobelia, very closely related species. But in this case, a shorter floral tube, blue, and it's pollinated by butterflies and sometimes bumblebees. It's not as attractive to birds. And you know what? To go from producing a blue flower to a red flower is really just a small mutation. It happens all the time in nature. And if you happen to suddenly start producing a red flower, you're gonna start to attract hummingbirds. And the hummingbirds that visit your flower are gonna preferentially visit other red-flowered mutant lobelias. And before too long, the red flower coloration has become ingrained into the population, all of a sudden you're on a separate trajectory and you're well on your way to becoming a new species. Pollinator shifts, it turns out, are one of the most important engines driving diversity of flowering plants. Here in the new world, lots of red flowered plants, lots of flowers that are attractive to hummingbirds. So hummingbirds themselves have done a lot to drive diversity. Everything seems to be in fast forward for these little birds. Their metabolism is incredibly high. They have a body temperature of around 107 degrees. Their heart can beat from 250 to over 1,200 times a minute. They breathe up to 250 times per minute. Their metabolism is so fast that they might starve if they don't eat nearly continually. So what happens at night or during bad weather? Well, hummers have found a unique way to deal with this problem. They enter torpor. Torpor in hummingbirds is essentially like entering hibernation every night. They find a comfortable perch. They reduce their heart rate to around 50 beats a minute. Their breathing becomes imperceptible and their body temperature drops to around 70 degrees. This saves them energy. And in the morning, they wake up and guess what? Right back at it, feeding nearly continually. Tiny birds make tiny nests. The resplendent males are essentially all show, and after mating, they have nothing at all to do with the nest construction, tending eggs, or young. All this work falls on the female. The nest material is commonly glued together with spider webs for strength. Generally, two eggs are laid and incubated for approximately two to three weeks. The tiny babies grow quickly, and at around three weeks old, they test their wings and take off for the first time, never to return to the nest. Already, they're masters of flight. A common problem that people call me about 
with hummingbirds is uh, that they'll hang up a feeder in April or May, and then they'll spend most of the summer with just maybe one male hummingbird coming to the feeder occasionally. And then all of a sudden, after they've called me and said, there's no hummingbirds at my feeder, August comes around. And when August comes around, it's just a train of one hummingbird after the other fighting for a space at the feeder. Now what's going on? Why are these hummingbirds doing this? Well, you gotta remember, hummingbirds are traveling here to breed. They nest here and they're raising young. So in August, all of the nestlings have fledged and these fledglings join the parents in stocking up on resources. They're no longer breeding. They're still consuming other food sources other than nectar, but they're not as reliant on catching so many insects. And there may not be as many flowering plants around that are really providing a good food source for these hummingbirds. And they have to bulk up because these hummingbirds are getting ready to make a massive migration from here all the way down to places like Central and South America to spend the winter time. And so this time of year, all that's on their mind is feeding. And back in May and June, they're feeding youngsters. And they're out there getting a lot of insect material and naturally provided nectar. And the migrations that these hummingbirds are making down to places like Central and South America, the neotropics, is really going home for hummingbirds. That's because hummingbirds, we believe, originated in the neotropics. And that's certainly where they're most diverse. So to see the most hummingbirds in the United States, you have to travel a little farther south and we have to go to a place that you might not think of as great hummingbird habitat. You probably wouldn't expect to find the highest diversity of hummingbirds anywhere in the United States in a place that looked quite like this. But this is it, the Madrean woodlands of the Sky Islands of southeastern Arizona. But not so many of them are up here where it's really high and dry. To see most of these beauties, we have to go down a little deeper into the canyons that dot this landscape. This little corner of the southwestern United States is full of things you can't find anywhere else in the U.S., like Arizona sycamore. Alligator juniper. I mean, take a look at the bark on this thing. It looks just like the back of an alligator. The incredible Arizona mountain king snake. And the wicked spiny shots yucca. And of course, hummingbirds. Lots of hummingbirds. my word. Of all hummingbirds to show up at this feeder, that's not the one that I expected. That's a magnificent hummingbird. It's definitely the largest of all the hummingbirds that are here, at least commonly here in the Santa Rita Mountains. The magnificent hummingbird is similar, at least in distribution, to most of the hummingbirds that make their summer home here in this part of Arizona. Most of those birds are really tropical birds that extend up into northern Mexico and just barely cross over into this part of Arizona and come here to breed, to raise young, and then migrate a short distance back across the border, in the case of most of the individuals, to spend the winter time. So really, this habitat, the Madrean, Oak, Juniper, Pinion, Woodlands, and the Sycamore Line Canyons of these Sky Islands in this part of Arizona are incredibly important to hummingbird diversity in this region of Arizona and in the United States. This part of Arizona hosts 18 species of hummingbirds. And some of those are fairly common locally. Others are really, really hard to find. They're very rare. Southern Arizona, and the southern parts of Texas are the two regions of this country that hold the largest diversity of hummingbirds. More common than the magnificent, the ones that have been visiting the feeder much more frequently, are the broad-billed hummingbird and the black-chinned hummingbird. 
The broad-billed hummingbird is probably the most gaudy and showy species that reaches the United States. Sitting in the shade is not that spectacular a bird, but when it flies out into the sun and hits you with just the right angle, the whole thing lights up blue or green. The broad is very easy to identify among the hummingbirds here because it's the only brilliant colored hummingbird with a bright orange bill just a tiny little dark tip at the end. So we have birds like the black chin hummingbird that have wide ranges out here in the western United States during the summer, and birds that are truly special, like the spectacular, magnificent hummingbird. It's an incredible place to come to observe the bounty that moves up from Mexico. Hummers are found from Alaska all the way to the very tip of South America. They get more diverse the closer you are to the equator. New York and Minnesota have only one species of common hummingbird. Arizona has 18, Belize 26, and the tiny country of Ecuador has over 130. A single mountain slope here in the Andes may have 50 species. This is where hummers are most diverse, northwestern South America. It's probably their ancestral home. Even here, feeders have become an important part of their daily routine. A lot of people might think that bird watchers are a little sick in the head because we're prone to doing things like traveling all the way across the country or sometimes all the way across the world just to see some hummingbird that shows up in somebody's backyard in a place like this. I kind of fall into that category of bird sickness because I drove from up in the Santa Ritas down to here just to see the incredible violet crowned hummingbird. One that habitually comes back to just this place in the United States. It's the best and most reliable place to see it. And when you see how many hummingbird feeders there are, you start to realize how important people have been in keeping these bird populations around and influencing these bird populations. And you also start to see how some species of hummingbirds have actually capitalized on what people do to make major changes in their distribution. The density of hummingbirds found here in southern Arizona has no doubt been influenced by the easy availability of food at feeders. The abundance of feeders in Tucson and Phoenix have drawn anise hummingbirds from their more westerly home range to backyards here, where they're now common. Thousands of birders make the pilgrimage to southern Arizona every year, trying to see as many species as possible. You might not think about dropping down into the hot, parched desert to find hummers, but there are species that specialize on this habitat, too. You just don't think about desert, I mean real desert, like this, as being very hospitable habitat for anything. But life is everywhere. As a matter of fact, there's hummingbirds here. We've been watching the true desert specialist hummingbird here in Arizona, Costas hummingbirds. And they've been coming up occasionally into these thickets of Ocotillo. And Costas has to be one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful, hummingbird in the United States. An incredible, bright purple sheen on its chin and these little extensions. And those chin feathers are called a gorget. And in this species, that gorget extends out like a little mustache down from the face. It's an incredibly beautiful species and one that specializes in places like this, thorn scrub and cactus forest, places that have a lot of flowers that are hummingbird flowers. Ocotillo is a very strange plant. A lot of folks, when they see it in the desert, they think this is a cactus. It is not a cactus, but it is woody, a little bit succulent, and only produces leaves when there's been abundant rain. The rest of the year, it just kind of looks like dead sticks. But in the spring, through the summer, what you oftentimes see after rains are beautiful flowers, bright red, full of nectar. But hummingbirds aren't the only species that pollinate most of these hummingbird specialized plants. Matter of fact, a lot of things visit plants like this. So why would they go to all the trouble of producing a flower that's made to fit the bill of a hummingbird that's red? Why would you go to all that trouble if it could be pollinated by something else like a bee or a wasp? It has to do with the distribution of a lot of these plants and their fitness. And it's speculated that populations of Ocotillo like this that are really only found on one south-facing hillside in this region and don't have another population for miles and miles 
may suffer from something called inbreeding depression if there's no outcrossing with other populations. I mean, plants need to breed. So when they breed with another population from a distant part of Arizona or even just the next canyon, it tends to keep the genetic diversity alive and keep the plant strong and keep it a vibrant population. And that provides food for not just the hummingbirds, but for all the pollinators and all the species that rely on this for nesting sites and for food. Well, how do the hummingbirds do that? They're mobile, they fly, and they migrate. So as they're migrating, they dip their bill in one of these, they fly a couple canyons away, sometimes hundreds of miles away, dip their bill in another ocotillo, and you get genes passing through populations that are separated and isolated. So hummingbirds have a large impact on their environment, much larger than would be suggested by their abundance. And that, that's exactly the concept and the definition of a keystone species. It's amazing to think that even the life in the desert is tied to the life of a little four gram bird. When it comes to migrants, the tiny rufous hummingbird is the champion, moving from Alaska all the way to the tropics. This is the longest distance migration in proportion to body size of any bird in the world. Given their popularity, you would think that we would know exactly where and when these birds migrate, but we're still learning. It turns out that if you leave your feeder up in the winter here in the southeast, you might get a surprise visitor, like this one in Clarendon County, South Carolina. Rufus hummers, along with a few other species like calliopes, have started showing up at feeders in the winter here. We don't know if this is a new migration pattern or one that went simply unnoticed. But Rufus are so predictable now that they're considered winter residents here in South Carolina. There's really not much to making hummingbird food. There's no reason to really spend a lot of money buying fancy nectars because you can make a very good hummingbird food right in your own kitchen. It doesn't require much. It's basically a four part water to one part sugar mix. And it's just standard table sugar, nothing fancy about it. So for me, for my feeder, it takes about four cups of water and a cup of sugar. We're gonna let the water heat up and it's basically boiling now. Stir in the sugar, really tough cooking. One cup of sugar to four cups of water. Just stick with that concentration. Make sure you stir it up until all of the sugar has dissolved and you've got hummingbird food. Once the food is done and the sugar's all dissolved, we're gonna pull that mixture off and we're just gonna set it and allow it to cool. That's just to allow the temperature of the mixture to be cool enough that it's not gonna melt your hummingbird feeder and put toxins into the food. Once the solution's been allowed to cool, all we have to do is fill the feeder. So just a simple funnel a feeder that's been cleaned in a one-tenth bleach solution. Make sure that it's fairly sterile. And voila, hummingbird food. It's not very difficult, but you'll notice my hummingbird food may look a little different than the stuff you're using. It's not red. We don't use red food coloring when we're making hummingbird food. The red dye in food coloring, any kind of red dye, may not be really helpful for the bird and it may actually be harmful for the bird. So clear sugar is just fine. The birds are gonna be attracted to the red of the feeder anyway. So you don't really have to worry about the liquid itself having color. So once you've spent the whole five minutes making the mixture, it's just taking it outside. And really that's about all there is to feeding hummingbirds, at least with artificial food. You wanna make sure you hang your feeder above the ground and it can be a few feet from the ground, it can even be way up high. Some of the best, most visited feeders that I have are right up almost to the roof line. And when you hang them up high, you're also getting them away from potential problems that you'll face from other animals wanting to use the feeder, things like squirrels. <laughs> so making sure it's off the ground is important. And that's about it. You just wanna make sure that you change that nectar out about once every three to five days during the heat of the summer because it will ferment and fermented nectar can be deadly to hummingbirds. Well, just hanging a feeder in a yard isn't enough to bring hummingbirds to it. You need to have a yard that suits hummingbirds. And that means having a wildlife friendly yard. One that provides cover, water, and places to make a nest, in addition to just food. So 
A perfect hummingbird yard is one that incorporates a lot of structure. You want a lot of edges, and you want different varying heights of landscape plants. That means you want some trees, some forested area. You want some shrubs in lower places, and some branches that are exposed out over open areas where hummingbirds are likely to feed. Hummingbirds are really peculiar. They like to use the same perch over and over again. It's pretty easy to track them. If they're coming to your feeder, they'll go right back to the same branch, usually one that's sticking up high above the others, and they'll return to that branch habitually. It's called a habitual perch, and it's something hummingbirds are just neurotic about. So making sure you have a lot of structure, making sure you have a lot of plants that are pollinator friendly, because remember, hummingbirds aren't the only species that we need to be concerned about in a yard. Pollinators in general are in decline all around the world, and the more plants that we provide that provide food sources for pollinators, the better our pollinator population is gonna be. If you want great hummingbird plants, they're not hard to find at your local garden center. Remember, red or orange tubular flowers are keyed to birds, that means hummingbirds. A single hummingbird may make more than 1,000 visits to flowers every day. And hummingbirds can live to be more than 10 years old. And that translates into over three million visits to flowers in a lifetime. That's power. The power to change the world around you. We're still finding out about their behavior, even their migration routes. And that doesn't surprise me. It should take time. It takes patience to understand the lives of these little birds that really live in Fast Forward. I'm Patrick McMillan, wishing you your own exciting expedition.